Good morning, and welcome to our Great Ideas Lecture on Truth. For the lecture, we are very delighted to have with us Mr. Robert Shetterly, all the way from the state of Maine. If you've been down to the Creek Cafe sometime in the last month, you may have noticed a series of portraits called Americans Who Tell the Truth. The eight portraits down at the Creek are just a small sampling of the now over 200 portraits that Mr. Shetterly has created for this series. Robert Shetterly was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, and he is a graduate of Harvard University, and he settled in Maine in 1970, where he's continued to produce a stunning variety of art. His work has been displayed throughout the U.S. and Europe, and has made appearances in locations ranging from elementary schools to the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City. His portraits reflect not only his interests, but also his own humanitarian work that has taken him to places such as Rwanda, as well as Appalachia. His series, Americans Who Tell the Truth, highlights citizens who are addressing social, environmental, and economic fairness in our world and in our country. Down at the creek, you'll see eight examples of these, and you'll get to see a few more this afternoon. And the portraits will be on display at the creek through next Saturday. So if you haven't seen them yet, we encourage you to take a trip down to the creek and see them. Before Mr. Shetterly comes up, I'd like to offer a quote from one subject of one of his portraits, Natasha Myers. Natasha Myers says, We need artists to help explain what is happening in this country, to tell the truth and reveal the lies to be willing to say the emperor has no clothes, to create moral indignation, to envision alternatives, to reinvent language. We need artists to help us come together and share our voices and build community around powerful issues concerning our roles in the world and our planet's survival. Compassion must be translated into action. Mr. Shetterly is just such that artist for us today. And as he comes, I ask you to give him your utmost attention and ask what truth he might have for us this morning. Thank you. What a, what a pleasure to be here. I have never been in this part of, um, I've been in Tennessee before, but never in this particular area and, and never at Carson Newman. And I, I'm very grateful that I, to, be, to have been invited here. So, and it's been a real pleasure to get to know Dave McNeely. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the paintings that I make and somewhat in relationship to uh, how I think about truth. And hopefully we can, some of you in the classes I'll be in later, we can talk more about that. This series of paintings I didn't want to do. I had no intention of ever being a portrait artist. I was a, uh, I'm a self-taught artist and I developed a voice as an artist that was all about ambu ambiguity and mystery. I was a surrealist. But about uh, 15 years ago, in the run-up to, right after 9-11, in the run-up to the Iraq War, uh, I became just furious, enraged uh, at what was happening in this country and why. And who was, is, is that still working? I'm not, I'm not sure. You can hear the voice going through in and out. Anyway, as long as you can hear me, I'm fine. Um, I was really upset about how this country was being taken into another war which didn't need to be fought. I'm not talking about the military here. Um, I'm talking about our political leaders who were using propaganda and misinformation and uh, super patriotism to engineer this country into a fight that shouldn't have been fought. You know, at the, uh, a lot of you at this time were, you know, just little, little tiny kids. And, you know, right after 9-11, our administration at that time began to make the case that Iraq was somehow involved with 9-11, that there was Al-Qaeda in, in Iraq, that um, somehow they've been involved in the taking down of the Twin Towers in New York. You know, none of that was true, and they were also claiming that they had these weapons of mass destruction. That wasn't true either, and they knew that. Um, 
you know, today in the press and in our political world, this, the truth of this issue is never really discussed. What we get instead is um, people often saying, oh, well, to go into Iraq was a mistake. You know, it was a, a calculation that was uh, a mistake, but it happened and we'll just have to deal with it. It wasn't a mistake. You know, it was an engineered plan. And anybody who was really paying attention at that time would know that or could know that. Uh, but not by watching our major media. And there's where the real problem comes. Because it's, it's not unusual at all for governments of countries to lie to their about one issue or another. That happens all in every country under any system. In this country, we have theoretically a protection against that kind of, of uh, disinformation from our government. And that's why we have a free press, at least the idea of a free press. The free press is supposed to, and that's why it's written into our Constitution, exactly for that purpose. To listen to what the government is saying or politicians are saying and say, well, that's true, that's not true, it's half true, it's whatever it is. But there are protections. Not all of us certainly has the time to investigate everything that's being said. I mean, just some of you may have watched that debate last night. I mean, how would you know? whether every one of those things that is being said is true or not. You don't, it's, it's very hard to check all that yourself. That's why we're supposed to have a free press. We don't really have a free press in the major media. We have a corporate press. You know, these are corporations that run the press, which their bottom line is not the health of democracy. It's their own finances. And so they're willing to skew the news one way or another to protect their own interests. That's a very different thing than a free press. And in the run-up to the Iraq War, they're more interested in ratings and money and all the drama and fear that was being produced that was enabling that war than they were in actually um, telling the truth. That's a huge problem. You know, it's something that um, I'm not sure um, you know, how we're going to get away from that, how we're going to get our media in this country decorporatized so that we can actually have a functioning democracy based on around media that does actually know that its job is to tell the truth to us about what's going on rather than protect their own interests. But we got that war, and I was in the run-up to it, I was thinking, you know, I can't live with this. Not because of just you know, sort of abstract issues around democracy, but when you, you know, create a war, a lot of people get hurt. There are an enormous number of victims. There's an extraordinary amount of grief that's produced. And I was thinking, you know, I've got to respond to this in some way. That the, the, uh, what I used to do as is, is a sort of a surrealist artist seemed insufficient to the moment. Somehow I felt like I had to engage my talents as an artist in a much more direct way with my own role as a citizen in this country, to have a voice. I felt, I felt unless I could engage in some way, I, ha I, I felt totally voiceless. I felt alienated and isolated. And so the, the solution to me uh, finally came, actually at my wife's suggestion, who was getting really tired of hearing me rant about politics. I mean, nobody likes to hear a somebody rant all the time about what's going on. I decided to, through my art, start surrounding myself with people that I really admired from the history of this country, instead of complaining constantly about the people I didn't. And it opened up uh, not only sort of a, a new world for me in terms of, of history and uh, ethics and knowledge of the true history of this country, but also a way of being in the world changed completely when I started to engage directly with what I thought was not going well. And so what I want to do is show you a few of the people I painted. And through the process of doing these paintings, I have become sort of a storyteller, uh, each one telling a particular point about American history and 
the struggles of this country to be the country that it claims to be. You see that? Maybe we could dim the light just a little bit, but um, that person you're looking at right there is one of this country's greatest playwrights, a man named Arthur Miller. Maybe some of you have you know, seen his plays or performed in them. Um, things like Death of a Salesman or All My Sons or The Crucible. He often used drama to attack and explore some of the most crucial problems of, um, that he thought were going on in terms of social economic justice in this country. But the reason I show him, him to you right now is just because of um, something he said one time. Each one of these paintings, they're fairly large. If you go over to the creek and see them, they're painted on wooden panels. They're 36 by 30 inches, and they have quotes from each person carved right into the surface of the painting. And his quote is, I think the job of the artist is to remind people of what they have chosen to forget. You could think about that in a lot of different ways, and, and it's meant to be somewhat ambiguous because of well, what is it for each one of us that we choose to forget? Usually it's something essential about our humanity and our relationship with other people and with community and our own responsibility. We choose to forget that. And he, Arthur Miller, is saying that it's the role of artists and their obligation in society to keep reminding us of some of those things. And I've taken that as sort of my motto as I've thought about the paintings I'm making and uh, the, the purpose that I'm trying to use them for. Let me show you another one. This is a woman named Sojourner Truth. How many of you, just raise your hands, how many of you have ever heard that name or know who she is? Whoa, great. Man, I go into a lot of places and never heard of her. Um, interesting thing about her was that first her name was not Sojourner Truth. Her slave name was Isabel. And she was not a slave in Mississippi or Alabama or Georgia or Tennessee, you know. She was a slave in New York. You know, a lot of people don't seem to realize that, you know, New York and New Jersey had slavery until 1827, just one generation before the Civil War. I mean, it's often played that, well, we have the North and the South and, you know, slave states, non-slave states and all that sort of stuff. Well, it wasn't at all that clean or clear, you know, there were the major economic engine of this, the whole United States was slavery for many years, not just the South. And slavery was legal in New York State. This woman was 30 years old, Isabel was 30 years old before she was freed when slavery finally ended. And everything that happened to slaves in the South happened to her. Her family, her husband were sold away from her. She was a field slave. She was, for her time, and any time, actually remarkable, in the sense that she was six feet tall, she was incredibly strong, and she remained illiterate all of her life. But uh, during the run-up to this period before the Civil War, she became one of the greatest abolitionists in this country and one of its greatest speakers. I mean, often you'd see a platform that had Frederick Douglass, some uh, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, uh, William Lloyd Garrison, you know, all these great abolitionists all speaking at the same time from the same place. We know what she says because she was such a great speaker that people followed her around and wrote down her speeches. When she was freed, she left the farm in upstate New York and came to New York City and got a job working as a domestic in a white woman's house. And she was a very religious person. And she believed that God and angels spoke to her. And whenever that she heard their voices, she tried to do whatever they said. And one day she heard this voice that said, your name shall be Sojourner. You know, a sojourner is a traveler. She knew what that meant. And the very next day, she just walked away from the place where she was working. For some reason, she walked out onto Long Island, you know, headed east from New York City. She had a stick over her shoulder with a couple of threadbare dresses tied up in a knot, just like a hobo. And she had walked for a couple of days when she met a woman and said, what's your name? She said, 
sojourner. She said, what's your last name? She didn't have a last name. But this voice came back and said, your name shall be Sojourner Truth. And she knew then that her name was going to be her destiny. That what her job was in the world was to travel around and remind people about ending slavery entirely and also women's rights. In the 1850s, she was out in Ohio at one of these, a, a big uh, sort of um, session where people would come from all over the place to talk about abolition. And she gave this talk in which she said the, the quote that I put on her painting, in which she says, now I hear is talking about the Constitution and the rights of man. And I comes up and I takes hold of this Constitution. And it's mighty big. And I feel for my rights, but there ain't any there. And then I says, God, what ails this Constitution? And he says to me, Sojourner, there is a little weasel in it. Well, God was talking to her, and God told her there was a weasel in our Constitution. You know, what does she mean? You know, what she meant was that, you know, in 1787, when our Constitution was signed, and here was this incredible document for the first time in the world history, tried to build a political society around ideas of justice, equality, freedom, inalienable rights, you know, all those things that are in our Constitution and Declaration. It said all those things. But then who got them? Who got them? You know, the only people who got those rights were land-owning white men. Those words about justice and equality were completely hollow in relationship to everybody else. You know, I often think that um, the signing of our Constitution is almost like a moment of religious betrayal, where you declare your greatest principles and then you deny them at the moment you sign it. Most people in this country did not get them. The slaves weren't freed, freed blacks, women, Native Americans, you know, everybody else left out. What do you do then? You know, how does that change? It doesn't change because the people in power, in this case the rich white folks, wake up one day and say, we forgot to give women the right to vote, man, we gotta change this real quick. It happens, and this is what so, to me becomes so fascinating and interesting about our history, is that it changes you know, not because people in power wanted to change or realize that they've made a mistake. It changes because the people who've been left out, the marginalized, often the humiliated, are the people who insist that, it, that the language we've used, all that great language about equality and freedom and justice, be made real, real for them also. It has to come from them. That's what's so exciting, and that's what I think, in my opinion, gives any country its real nobility, is when it struggles to live up to its own ideals, to its own truths. In the context of this talk today and the title of the paintings that I make, Americans Who Tell the Truth, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about you know, whether God exists or not. I'm talking about the truth around which we decided to build a society. Are they real for everyone? Are they available for everyone? You know, do people have access to those truths, to that promise? Are they real in their lives? The struggle, you know, it's, it's like, you know, at, at that moment when we signed the Constitution, we separated our walk from our talk. It's that enormous struggle to bring those two things back together. And then my job has been to try to paint some of the people who worked on that. Let me just tell you another story. You probably all know who this is. This is Rosa Parks. Uh, you know, what's interesting is, you know, she got her training right here in just south of here in, in Newbark at... at um, the Highlander Center. That's where she came to train. You know, she came up here from Montgomery, Alabama, went to the Highlander Center, and that's where she learned 
how to do uh, nonviolence, you know, uh, nonviolent uh, civil disobedience, right here. Um, when I was uh, nine years old in 1955, when she sat on that bus in Montgomery, I was told in Cincinnati, and I still hear this in schools around this country, that the reason she sat there was because she was tired, that her feet hurt. Teachers still teach that, which is interesting. Um, you know, when you say that about a person who's acting with enormous energy and idealism and incredible courage, I mean, remember that in 1955 in Montgomery, if you did what she did, she could have been killed. Her house bombed, her church bombed. I mean, all those things were happening all around her. Why not, you know? It could have happened right there. Um, so it was an enormous risk. And um, she was, you know, what, what people, when people say that the reason she did that was because she was too tired to move, she is stripped of all her idealism and all her courage. She doesn't have any. She's kind of a sad person then, whose feet hurt enough that she would rather get arrested than move a few steps on a bus. She's, when she heard that people saying that, she said the quote that's on her painting, which I put, the only tired I was, was tired of giving in. But what we miss when we tell her story is this story. Some of you know who that is, that's Claudette Colvin. Nine months before, in the, in the late winter of 1955, this 15-year-old girl, Claudette Colvin, was going to an all-black, I mean, you know, the schools then were totally segregated. Uh, she, so she's going to an all-black high school in Montgomery, the same, same city as where Rosa Parks lived. And she was on that bus. She was on a bus, and she was sitting in, just like Rosa Parks, she was sitting in the front row of what was the black section. And, she, and the, you know, uh, another, the white section filled up, and another white person got on, and the bus driver gestured at her and said, go, sit, go stand in the back of the bus so this person can sit down. The interest, one of the really interesting things about that moment was that the seat across the aisle from Claudette was open. There was nobody sitting there. This white person could have gotten on the bus and sat next to her. And the law said at that time in Montgomery that a white person could not sit across the aisle from a black person because it implied equality. And so she was told to move. I mean, just think of how this country has changed since then. But one of the things that was so interesting then is she refused. Here's this 15-year-old girl. I mean, Rosa Parks had, had been trained on how to deal with that kind of anxious moment when you do something in public which goes against the status quo, which goes against um, social mores. This girl had not been trained at all. You know, she's just sitting there and told to move, and she says on that bus, the Constitution allows me to sit here. Well, you can imagine that didn't go over real well. And the bus driver started to yell at her and called her names and everything and told her to move, and she kept saying, the Constitution allows me to sit here. Well, in those days, of course, there were no cell phones, so he had to stop the bus. He gets off the bus. He finds a phone. He calls the police. The police come and drag her off the bus. The whole time she's shouting, the Constitution allows me to sit here. Think of the courage that took. So she's taken to jail. I'm going to skip a lot of her story, but the, one of the really interesting things is that the case that went to the U.S. Supreme Court, which overturned bus segregation, was not Rosa Parks' case. It was Claudette Colvin's case. It was a 15-year-old kid who actually, whose name was on that case, along with some other women, also not Rosa Parks, Who's, who actually overturned that law. Interesting. You know, often the, the really greatest, 
you know, political moments of, of change in this country. You know, don't depend on voting. They don't depend on adults making decisions. They often depend on a person with courage to stand up against the injustice. You know, and often it doesn't have to be, it can be anybody, and it can, it can be a child who has that courage. Years later, just a few years ago, a man named Philip Hose, actually an author from Maine, where I come from, wrote a book about Claudette Colvin that won the National Book Award. And at the event in, um, in New York City, when, when, they, when Philip was given the prize, he invited Claudette, who was then 70 years old, to come to the, the ceremony. And so he received the award, and he spoke, and everything was great. But all the, the press there weren't so interested in talking to him. They wanted to talk to her. And the question, of course, they had for her was, Claudette, why didn't you move? Didn't you realize the risks you were taking? You know, and they were also interested because what had your parents told you about being in a situation like that? Because it was so dangerous. And of course, her parents had told her, Claudette, if you're ever in a situation where, you know, white folks are ordering you to do something, just do it. Your life is worth more than anything else that will happen at that moment. And so the, these people in the press, they said, why didn't you move? And Claudette said, I wanted to. I actually intended to move. She said, I started to get up, and I felt Harriet Tubman's hand on my shoulder pushing me back down. And then she said, I tried to get up again, and I felt Sojourner Truth's hand on my other shoulder pushing me back down. She said, I couldn't move then. I had to ask myself, what would they do? What would those two women do in this situation? And there was only one answer. They would not move. That's what I like to call narrative activism. You know, that when you've got a story from your own history, a true story, that enables you to act in a context that gives you the courage to do the thing that you think you have to do at that moment. Sometimes if we don't teach those stories, if we don't teach those stories from our own history, you know, how in the world are we going to know how to act at any moment? Let me give you another example. It's not a very clear picture, but um, that's Woody Guthrie. Do you all know who Woody Guthrie was? Well, he's one of this, you know, this country's greatest folk singers and one of the first people probably to use music um, as a tool for social justice. Primarily, I mean, a lot of people know about him because he wrote the song, This Land is Your Land. Um, I mean, a lot of places in this country, if you ask kids who's Woody Guthrie, they don't know, but if you say, well, can you sing This Land is Your Land? Oh, sure, yeah, we know the song. I mean, I'm sure you all know it, right? Um, before that, before he wrote that song, during the Depression and the Dust Bowl, you know, he was traveling around to refugee camps. I mean, we hear an awful lot about immigrants and refugees these days. You know, during the Dust Bowl and the Depression, there were hundreds of thousands of refugees generated from our own communities in the Southwest, a lot of whom ended up in California looking for jobs you know, picking peaches and beans and things like that, in which there weren't enough jobs, and they, so they were stuck in these camps without food and shelter and without the compassion of their neighbors in the most cases. So what to do then? Woody Guthrie would go to these camps where people were, and these were people who had been sort of real salt-of-the-earth farmers, very independent, uh, strong people who were took great pride in taking care of themselves and living dignified lives in relationship to the land and their communities. They could no longer do that. And here they were in these refugee camps without food, without work, and stripped of their dignity. Woody Guthrie would go to those camps, the people would tell their stories, and then he would sing their stories back to them. He would compose music on the spot that told their stories. This is one of the great things that art can do. In that simple transformation of taking a person's story 
and turning it into an art form and then singing it back to the people, they felt authenticated. They felt that somebody had listened. It made all the difference to them to hear somebody care enough about who and what they were and what they'd been through to turn it into music for them. During the Second World War, uh, by the way, I want to say something else about that song, This Land is Your Land. Most of us who know that song probably only know the first two or three verses, the ones that celebrate how big this country is, how beautiful it is from the you know, redwood forest to the Gulf Stream waters, you know, the open highway, it belongs to you, it belongs to me. Isn't that magnificent? That is not what the song's about. Those first verses, which are the ones we are taught, were the kind of setup to get to the last verses, which were all about the question that he had, you know, just stewing in his heart and mind after having gone through the Depression and the Dust Bowl. And that question is in one of the verses that I've scratched into the surface of this painting. He says, one bright sunny morning in the shadow of the steeple, just think about how he set that up just so simply. The people that he's talking about are not in the church. They're outside the church and they're in its shadow. One bright sunny morning in the shadow of the steeple by the relief office, I saw my people. As they stood there hungry, I stood there wondering if this land was made for you and me. That's what the song was about. He wanted to entice you into the song with all those verses about this great big beautiful place that belongs to you and me. But then he wanted to ask you the question, is it really for you and me? You know, is this great inequality that's going on here for both of us? Why are some people left out? Why this enormous wealth disparity? How are some people able to go through these horrible times and other people not? Why aren't we helping each other more? In the next verse, he comes up against a sign that says, private property, no trespassing. And he walks around the other side of the sign, and it doesn't say anything. And he says, that's the side of the sign that's made for you and me. During the Second World War, he, he got a job working on a merchant marine ship. He felt he needed to do something. And, you know, these, the, during the war, the, the, all the supplies were taken across the Atlantic Ocean to, to Europe to fight um, Germany and Italy in these huge convoys of ships. You know, in the center would be all the ships that are carrying the supplies, the men, the military stuff, the food, everything like that. Out around them are, you know, battleships, hundreds of ships. He got a job. He was on a, a deckhand on a troop carrier. That means that 3,000 men would be below decks, you know, inside an iron hull of this ship going across the Atlantic. At night, almost every night, these convoys were attacked by German submarines. U-boats, they were called. And so the German submarines are shooting torpedoes you know, trying to blow up the supply ships and the troop ships that are in the center of the convoy. Just imagine for a second that you are a soldier in one of those troop ships. You're with, you're in total, you know, pitch blackness. You're below decks. You're hearing, the ship is shaking with all the explosions of depth charges and torpedoes. And you know that if one of them hits your boat, you're gone. You know, you're below decks, it's going to fill with water, there's no way out. You're terrified. And you're sitting there in the dark, and there's 3,000 men, and they're all terrified individually. Woody Guthrie is up on deck. He's thinking about those men down in the hole where they're going through this, uh, this attack. And he goes and gets his guitar, and he goes down below decks, and he spends all night singing with those men, getting them to sing songs with him. Again, about the power of music, the power of art. It creates community. It stops, it, it builds morale. He got a reputation for doing that. And, but he did it every time they were under attack. He would always spend the night down below with the men, singing. 
One night, he's down there singing with some men, and the bombs and the torpedoes are going off, and he hears voices behind the bulkhead, you know, a big iron wall, and there are other people there who aren't in with these other men. And he goes up to the captain and says, Captain, I hear other voices. Who are these people who are down there? Why can't they come in and sing with the rest of us? And the captain says, oh, I can't do that. It's against regulations. And he said, what do you mean it's against regulations? Oh, those are the black soldiers. Here we were, you know, fighting this great battle, this great war for democracy and freedom and liberty, and our soldiers were segregated. So Woody Guthrie says, well, I guess I can't sing anymore then. And he walks away. And the captain ran after him and grabbed him and said, I guess we can bend the rules tonight. And he opened the door and the soldiers came in. That was the first time during the Second World War where our soldiers were integrated. You know, and it didn't happen because politicians in Washington said, oh, geez, this doesn't look good. We're, you know, claiming to be fighting for democracy and we've got segregation in our, our own, you know, military. It happened because of the courage and leverage of one man at one moment to do the right thing. You know. Often that's what it takes, and that's what's often asked of us. You know, it's the truth of those moments when we know what the right thing to do is, and we know what's wrong, and whether it's you know, some of one of our friends or somebody we don't even know being bullied, or it's some you know, incredible moment, like you know, you're on a ship like that and something uh, terrible is happening, and it's in that context that you, you are asked to, be, to act that's what's being asked. And I, I'm fascinated with how knowing stories like that, which I was never told and never taught when I was in school, uh, can change uh, the way we, um, how we think ourselves about acting when we're in difficult situations. Let me uh, show you uh, one more picture here. I know I've only got a couple minutes, but I want to tell a quick story. This is a young girl named Barbara Johns. That name ain't anything to anybody? She's from Virginia. She was from Farmville, Virginia. You probably all know about um, you know, what the case was in 1954, which integrated our schools all over this country. It was called Brown versus Board of Education. Um, it required the schools to integrate, but not really. And a lot of schools systems uh, didn't do it. But anyway, that's, that was the intent of the case, and it laid the groundwork for the, um, at least the legal thinking about why it was necessary to integrate. Where did that start? You know, where does a case like that come from? You know, why we, I mean, I was never taught anything but just the name of the case, and, and maybe that a lawyer named Thurgood Marshall uh, was the one who argued it. Well, it had several origins, that case, and one of them was this girl, 16 years old, going to a black high school in the little town of Farmville, Virginia. And her school was, you know, they, they, we called that separate but equal in those days. But of course, it wasn't equal. It was separate, but the schools were very different. And her school had no library, it had no books. It was built for 180 kids, it had over 450. It was, you know, immensely overcrowded. The classrooms were in uh, beat-up old school buses. It had very little heat. You know, it was a terrible situation. And this girl was smart. She was ambitious. And she knew that her life might depend on getting a good education. What to do, you know? And she decided, all by herself, that she would try to change the situation. That she knew that she wanted a good education, and she was going to demand it. So one day, she called her principal and disguised her voice and said, there's some kids from our high school down in the center of town. They're causing trouble. You better get out of the high school and go do something about it. And so the principal, who would have stopped her plan probably from working, left the high school. Then she sent, and this, I'm not uh, suggesting you all do things like this that would uh, get you all kicked out of school, but it's amazing sometimes what one does and then the effect it has. She sent notes to all the teachers saying, bring all the kids immediately to an emergency meeting in the cafeteria, and she forged the principal's name on all those notes. The teacher showed up with all the kids, and they're wondering why they're there, and she stands up. And she says, 
If we're going to live successful lives in this society, we need good education. We're not getting it here. We need to go to our superintendent and demand a fully equal. She wasn't even asking for integration. She said a fully equal school. Otherwise, we, our lives will be shortchanged. And she said, I'm going to walk out of this school right now and go to the superintendent's office, and I want all of you to follow me. 450 kids walked out of that school and went to the superintendent's office. The teachers didn't. The kids did. And when they got there, of course, he's this white guy who says, you know, you kids better go back to school. You're going to get suspended. And she says, no, no, we're not going to get suspended. We're going to go on strike. We're not going to go to school until you give us a better school. And he said, oh, well, if you do that, your parents are going to lose their jobs. I mean, that was a typical tactic in, all over the place when people stood up for civil rights was to actually lose their jobs. She said, we're going to go on strike. They struck the school. The, fam the community came together in a large group and stood behind the kids. Some lawyers in Virginia, black lawyers in, in Richmond, Virginia, heard about this case and they came to the community and they didn't go to the superintendent, they didn't go to the teachers, they didn't go to the parents. They went to the girl and said, Barbara, you know, what can we do? You know, how can we take this case? We think that if you're really going to get an equal education, it has to be about integration. And she said, okay, let's do that. Well, the next thing that happened, the Klan was burning crosses and the whole works. But that became, that case, which started in 1951, became one of the centerpiece cases of Brown versus Board of Education. It started with a 16-year-old girl. You know, people, all of us, have, you know, we, we look at the world today, I think, at least I do, and you think about the immense power of money, of governments, uh, of corporations, of you know, just all those centers of power that seem to make us all cynical about our ability to change anything. Often, you know, a single person or a community of people with the courage to stand up behind an idea and insist on it have an equal and sometimes greater power than all the rest of that stuff. And that's what's so incredible. When we stand behind the things that we think are true and demand them, we can have enormous power to change society, to be more just, more equal, more fair, to give all people more dignity. Thank you very much.